So the second half of this chapter, we're going to be looking at experiments. And so the first thing we need to do is um, talk about the difference between an observational study versus actual experiment. So an observational study, um, we've got, we're just observing individuals. We're measuring variables of interest. interest. There is no attempt to influence the response. Okay? No attempt to actually influence the responses. The goals of an observational study would be things like describing what's happening, just watching, observing, observing, and being able to describe what's happening, comparing two things, okay? again, watching, observing, and then comparing the results, okay? um, look for relationships, examine relationships between variables, but not to impose an, a, treat, a treatment, not to see if one thing causes another thing. Okay, that would be left up to an experiment. So an experiment okay, is going to deliberately pose a treatment on an individual, and then it's going to try to measure their responses. Okay, so with an experiment, your goals for an experiment are to determine, um, to determine if the treatment causes a response. Okay, so you're looking to see if the treatment has an actual impact. And again, that treatment was deliberately imposed on the treatment subjects. Okay, um, an experiment is what you need to do to determine cause and effect. An observational study cannot determine cause and effect. Only an experiment can. Okay, um, an experiment is going to contain... Just like you're used to in science class, it's going to contain our explanatory or independent variable. Uh, in stats here, we call it the explanatory variable, but this is what you would have used in um, science as your independent variable, as well as your response variable, which again, what we're calling in science, our dependent variable. Okay? But they're the same thing. My explanatory variable or my independent variable, that is the treatment that I am impo imposing to see if it actually causes the change. And the response or the dependent variable is the actual change or response. So let's look at this example that we have here. Does taking hormones reduce heart attack after menopause? We're going to determine whether this is an observation or an experiment. This is a really long setup here, so pause for a minute and read it, so I'm not going to waste your time reading it to you. Okay, so hopefully you took a minute and you read it. And so this, this setup here shows you the difference between an observational study versus an experiment. So up here, okay, in 1992, it was determined that women who took hormones reduce their risk of heart attack. A, um, it, but that was solely based on an observational study. A, that was based on basically women that could afford to take hormones. And so those, women's were, those women were thought to, in general, have better health care. Therefore, a, a, lower, a naturally lower risk of heart attack. You could not say, because this was an observational study, there could be no cause and effect link. We can't do that with an observational study. So to be able to do that cause and effect link, an experiment had to happen. And so with an experiment, the women wouldn't get to choose. The women would be randomly assigned to either a hormone replacement pills or the placebo pill group. And ideally, if it was a really good experiment, they would not know which one they're getting. Neither would the treating doctor know which one they got, because if the treating doctor knew, he could kind of treat them a little bit differently, and um, that could have an impact. And so if it was a really good study, it would be an uh, experiment, it would be done that way, where nobody knew what anybody got, except for the statistician behind the big curtain who's running the experiment. So once they did the actual experiment where they had groups of women that were taking hormone replacement pills and groups that were taking placebo pills, um, and there was several different ages and different backgrounds, and they realized that it actually did not help lower the risk of heart attack. And it actually changed the way um, we were treating older women as they went into menopause. So our previous example of the women in the hormone therapy um, gave us an example of this. 
what we call confounding variables. Okay, so a confounding variable is when something is confounding, we've got the effect of two variables on our response, and so you cannot figure out which one actually had the effect. You didn't have, basically there weren't enough constants, and so there were two things that were being changed and you weren't able to tell which one had the effect. For instance, in the observational study that was happening, um, the confounding things were the fact that you had these women that were taking hormones, but there was a large, and a, and you compared it to the women that were not, but you were not taking into account their backgrounds and their health history and their, um, you know, previous issues and their current cardiovascular health. None of that was being taken into consideration. So you could not just say, um, it could not definitively say that the hormones were lowering the heart attack level. So again, your confounding it is when I've got two variables that are having an impact on the response, and so I cannot decide definitively which one actually um, had the effect, change the responding variable. Okay, so let's look at some examples of these. So let's take a look at this first one here. Does reducing screen brightness increase battery life in laptop computers? Okay, take a second, read the, ex uh, read the scenario. Okay, so the question is just asking, was this an observational study or an experiment? Okay, and we have to justify our answer, which means we need to support. And again, when we're giving that support, we have to use our context here. So in this particular case, this was an experiment. And I can justify that by saying that there was a treatment that was imposed. And I would use my context to explain what that treatment was. Our treatment imposed was the brightness of the screens. That was controlled, and so we could say that that was the cause. So that uses our context, and that justifies um, what we said. We said that was an experiment, that we had a treatment being imposed, and that treatment was the brightness of the screens. I'm so sorry for the extra sloppy writing today. Okay, so let's look at this next example. Again, pause it for a second, read it so you can get a feel of the scenario. Okay, so for the first one, was this an observational study or an experiment? This one would be an observational study. There was not a particular treatment involved. They just observed. They took a survey and they determined how many uh, times a week that they ate dinner and then they looked at their grades. Okay? But there was not a treatment impose, a po imposed on them. So they were not assigned a number of days to eat dinner with their family. So they were not assigned, you know, one day or two days or four days or five days or whatever um, to eat meals with their family and then to see if that had an impact on their grades. Okay, so looking here at the explanatory versus the response variable, in the claim that they're making, my explanatory variable here is going to be the number of meals per week eaten with their family. So the number of meals per week eaten with the family. And what they're trying to do is to see if that impacts their GPA. So that would make their response variable be their GPA. And then the last question here asks you to explain clearly why such a study cannot establish a cause and effect relationship. Suggest a variable that may be confounded with whether families eat dinner or not. Okay, um, so there's probably, there's a number of variables that you could come up with this one, okay? um, but the reason why we cannot establish cause and effect is that there is other variables that are going to impact their GPA. The number of meals together is not the only thing that is impacting their GPA. So there's going to be other things, and we can't hold that constant for every single family. So, for example, you could have um, kids that work at night. Okay, so they work at night, so they can't eat as many meals with their family. They also, though, don't have as much time to study, okay? and so that could lead to lower grades. You could have families who have, their parents have two jobs, and so they're working at night, and so they can't eat together as a family, and then maybe the older sibling has to babysit the younger siblings, and so again, there's not as much time to study. Okay? So those things could be confounded and you can't determine whether it's 
the teenager's job, whether it's babysitting or anything else you could think of that would make it so that they have a lower GPA, not just how often they're eating dinner together with their family. Okay, so let's look at some more vocabulary associated with experiments then. So the treatment is going to be the specific condition that um, that's applied to the individuals. And that's going to be our treatment. So way back in our hormone study example, the treatment was whether they got the hormone or the placebo pill. Okay, so the treatment is the hormone pill that would they would have received if they were part of the hormone group. Okay, um, the experimental units are the smallest collection of individuals to which the treatment has been applied. If you're doing an experiment with humans, then those are usually called subjects. Okay, so the experimental units are basically what is receiving the treatment. And again, humans would be called subjects. Okay, so let's try to um, apply some of this vocabulary right now. So pause it, read your example. Okay, so let's break this down bit by bit. So the first part asks us to identify the experimental units. Okay, well, the experimental units, those will be the 14 middle schools. And this is where context becomes a huge deal. Okay, the 14 middle schools in, where were they, in North Carolina? Uh, Forsyth County, North Carolina. So the 14 middle schools in Forsyth County, North Carolina. That's my experimental unit. I wouldn't just say 14 middle schools because that doesn't give me enough information there. Okay, my explanatory variable here, so we're going to abbreviate that as our EV. So our explanatory variable here would be whether they use the career start program with their students or not. Okay, so career, and I'm going to shorten this uh, for space purposes. So whether they use career start or not. Okay, so that would be the explanatory variable. The dependent variable, so the dependent variable or the response variable. So the response variable, our RV here, that was a number of things. A, so what they were what they collected data on was attendance behavior, standardized test scores, level of engagement, um, whether or not they graduated from high school. All of those things would be response variables that they were gathering data about, that they were hoping to get changes in those based upon using the career start explanatory variable. And then the last part we have here is the treatments. So what were the treatments in this experiment? So the treatments in this experiment were whether they used the career start or not. So basically this experiment had two treatments. Okay? It had the standard curriculum and then it had the standard curriculum plus, so it had the standard plus the career start. And so those would be the two treatments that were being applied because every school did not get the career start. They were comparing. Okay? And so there were the explanatory variable is the whether they use career start or not, but the two actual treatments that they imposed was whether the school was just using the standard curriculum or they were using the standard curriculum and the career start together. One of the things I want to point out with this experiment is if we backtrack for a second to when we talked about the experimental units and we said our experimental units were the 14 schools, it was not the individual students, even though that's who they were actually gathering data on, was students from the 14 schools. It was not the individual students because the decision to decide, the decision to do the career start program or not was not on a student-by-student -student basis. It was a campus-by-campus -campus basis. Either the whole campus got career start or they did not. That's why the schools are the experimental units and not the individual students. So the experimental, um, the explanatory variables in experiment are also sometimes called factors. And you can actually have more than one explanatory explanatory. Um, variable within an experiment. And when you do, you have to pay attention to what we call the levels. 
and the levels are going to be your specific values for each factor. Remember, your factor is another term for your explanatory variable. And so your levels are your specific value for each factor. Okay, so for each explanatory variable, and we're going to look at this in just a second. Maybe in that hormone, let's talk about that hormone example, you may have been Maybe they had been trying to determine if not just hormones in general, but maybe if it low dose, uh, no dose versus lower dose versus a higher dose. A, um, and, and then if they brought in another experimental variable like exercise. A, and so our specific levels would be the levels of hormone dosage as well as the amount of exercise that they were doing. A, so let's look at an example of this. Okay, so like always, pause and read the example for a second. Okay, so let's apply our vocabulary to this. So in this particular case, um, we're asking to identify the experimental units or subjects, explanatory and response variables, and the, the treatments. So let's start with our experimental units or subjects. Okay, so our experimental units here would be the 120 undergraduate, we wouldn't just say students, undergraduate students, and if it had told us where they were undergraduate students, we would use all that information as well. Okay, so my subjects are the 120 undergraduate students. They are subjects, not experimental units, because we're talking about people. Okay, my explanatory variable here, so let's look at the explanatory variable options that we have here. So the explanatory variable here, there are two of them. Okay, there is the length of the commercial. There was a 90 second commercial versus a 30 second commercial. So the length of the commercial, okay, as well as how many times they saw it. Um, some people saw it one time, some people saw it three times, some people saw it, I can't spell, some people saw it five times. So the number of repetitions that the commercial was shown. The response variables here were all the things that were measured after the uh, program was over. So let's see, recall of the ad. Um, let's see, attitude towards the camera, as well as their intention to purchase the camera. So all of those things would be response variables, so in the intent to purchase the camera. So three response variables here. And then our last part asked for the treatments. And so the treatments gets a little bit, um, a little bit more a little bit tougher when you've got um, multiple explanatory variables in there. And you can create basically a data table to help you with this. You can have your first factor and your second factor. So we had 30 second commercial versus a 90 second commercial. Okay, and then we had, let me erase that line, it's too tall. Okay, and then we had the repetitions. So how many times they saw it. So they could have seen it one time, they could have seen it three times, and they could have seen it five times. So my possible treatments are all of these combinations. Okay, seeing the commercial one time, a 30 second commercial one time, seeing a 90 second commercial one time, seeing a 30 second commercial three times, a 90 second commercial three times, a 30 second commercial five times and a 90 second commercial five times. So this actually gives us six different treatment groups that we would need to be able to conduct this experiment. Okay, so when you have multiple explanatory variables, if you take the levels, the number of levels for each factor, so for factor A we had two levels, and for factor B, we had three levels, and we multiply those out, that'll give us how many treatment groups we would have, which is six treatment groups. And again, we would list these six treatment groups. Okay, I told them to you, but you would list them 
when you were answer when you were explaining this. I just don't have any more room on the screen. So again, our treatment groups would be all of these inside here. The one 30 second commercial, a 30 second commercial three times, a 30 second commercial five times, and then the same for the 90 second commercials, one time, three times, five times. So those would be our various treatments. Okay, so let's look at some examples of good versus bad experiments. We saw this when we were doing sampling and how we could get bias from bad sampling. So let's look at a bad experiment first. So a high school regularly offers a review course to prepare students for the SAT. This year, budget cuts will allow the school to offer only an online version of the course. Suppose the group of students who take the online course earn an average increase of 45 points in their math scores from a pretest to the actual SAT. Can we conclude that the online course is, is effective? The experiment is very simple design. You've got your group of subjects, so your students, they were given exposed to a treatment, the online course, and we're measuring the outcome, which is increase in math scores, and we got that desired outcome, that we had an increase in math scores there. But maybe you take a closer look at these students, and these students that are enrolled in the online course were students like y'all that were in advanced math courses in their school already. And so it would make sense that they would make a higher SAT score in the math section. And you, there's, this is another issue of confounding. We did not um, have any of the subjects that were not in advanced courses, so we don't know if it really was making a difference or not. So let's look at one of the things that would have helped make that experiment better. And first of all, you have to have random assignment, just like you did with sampling. So in an experiment, when we're talking about random assignment, that means our experimental units are assigned to treatments using a chance process. So they're assigned to whether they took the online course or not based on a chance process. Not we just signed up all of the AP statistics students for an online um, SAT review. Okay, and so when we're doing random assignments, you have to make sure that you're saying certain things when you're describing how this would be done. So let's look at this example here. So this year, the high school has enough budget money to compare the online SAT course with the classroom SAT course. 50 students have agreed to participate in an experiment comparing the two instructional methods. Eight, describe how we would randomly assign 25 students to each of the two methods. Eight, this problem is on page 241 in your book, and you can see the complete solution written out for you on page 241. Okay, if I write the complete solution for you right now, first of all, that will take forever, and it will be a hot mess of awfulness. Okay, there's not enough room on the screen. I'm writing with my finger to write all of these sentences. So we'll talk about it, and hopefully you opened your book and you went to page 241 and you can actually see it. Okay, so one of the first methods here is using 50 identical slips of paper. Okay, and so that would be our hat method there. Okay, that member we talked about, how that's a valid method, but you need to explain now how you're going to do it. You need to tell them that you're going to write every subject's name on the paper, because so far you just have 50 slips of paper. So you're going to write every subject's name on the paper, um, and then you're going to talk about how you're going to do it. Are you going to draw 25 of them out, and those first 25 you out are assigned to the online course? Do you draw 25 of them out, and the first um, 25 don't take, you know, just take the class? classroom course? Do you um, write online or classroom on the 50 papers? And you have each kid draw a slip of paper out and we see which one they get. Okay. Um, so you can describe how they're going to do that. It just has to, you have to make sure you're random. When you're describing the hat method, you don't have to worry about repeated things because you're not um, returning the slips to the hat. So for the second one, using technology here, you would have to describe how you're going to identify them. So remember, you have to give them numbers. We talked about this, labeling them. So remember your steps, right, were to label and then to randomize. So you have to label all the kids so they can basically go in your calculator. So we've got to label all the kids 1 through 50. Okay, and then you're going to explain how you're going to use your calculator to do it. You're going to write down the commands that you would use to do it. And in this case, you need to tell them that you would ignore any repeated numbers. Again, you have to address that. You have to have to address that when you are writing about this. You have to ignore any repeated numbers. 
and then you've got your first 25 take the online course and the, the, the leftover 25 will take the classroom course. So the last one they want you to describe here is for table D. So again, with using table D, you need to label before you can randomize. Remember, table using table D, all of the numbers have to be the same length. We have to have the same the same amount of digits in each number. So you'd be assigning them this time 0, 1 through 50 so that you could use your table D accurately. So that would be something they'd be looking for. A, um, you would let them know how you would go ahead and put into words that you're going to use two digit groups. So I'm going to use two digit groups and what direction I'm going to move. The fact that I'm going to move left to right. A, and then somehow you need to explain that you will reject any numbers that do not are not between um, z 0, 1 to 50. Uh, you would also reject your repeats. You'd throw out your repeats. So you would want to make sure that you have to emphasize that point again. A, that you are going to um, ignore any digits that are repeats or that do not fall between 0, 1, and 50. Okay, so let's kind of look at the things that make up a really good experiment. So the first thing is that you need to be able to compare things. We have to have a design where we can compare two or more treatments. They received this or they didn't. That would be my two treatments. Now I could compare more, like our example with the commercials versus length of commercial and how many times they saw it, but you need a minimum of two. You have to compare things. You need your control, you need your normal, and then you need to be able to compare your explanatory um, variable to that. Okay, you have to have random assignment. You have to use chance to um, assign your experimental units to treatments, especially when you're dealing with people. In those medical studies, you know, mental outlook can have a big effect on overall health. So if they know they're receiving a placebo instead of the experimental drug, it could make a difference in um, their mental outcome, which wouldn't necessarily give you valid results. So random assignment and then um, keeping a, a control. Keeping all your other variables um, the same for all the groups that could affect your response. So in science, this is really what we call our constants, right? Keeping all those constants okay, so that we can s definitively say that this is the thing that caused our change, that caused our results. And then replication. Replication is a little bit different than what you think of when you think of a science experiment. We think replication more as repeated trials. I have to go do my experiment X number of times to gather enough data. In statistics for replication, we just need to know that we have enough experimental units in each group so that we can, so that any differences in the effect of our treatments can be distinguished distinguished from chance differences between the groups. So I can't have an ex a, a treatment group that has like one experimental unit in it. So I need repeated enough experimental units in my group, and then that way I can help. Um, that helps eliminate anything that could be due to chance because I have a large enough um, experiment. I have a large enough number of experimental units. Okay, so let's take a look at a well-designed experiment. Pause it, read it, and we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's look at how the four principles of experimental design were used in this uh, physician's health study. Um, this particular experiment is on page 244 in your book. So again, you can see the entire solution written out and kind of exactly what they're looking for when they write them out. So our four components, right, were comparison. So did we have comparison? Do we have enough treatment groups in this particular experiment to have comparison. Hey, we did. We have a design that gave us both the active treatments as well as the placebo. So we were able to compare the two. You could compare the active treatment to the placebo. Okay, our second component is that random assignment. Okay, and so we the subjects here that were receiving each of the four combina the four treatments, four treatment combinations, okay, which here, we see our table done. There were four treatment combinations. Eight, the subjects were randomly assigned to one of the four treatment groups. The third part is control, or what we think of as our constants. So the experiment, you'll notice, used subjects that were of the same gender. They were of the same, I've lost my spot in where they described the subjects. Here we go. 
right here. So they were males, they were the same gender, they were the same occupation, so they should have had similar stresses on them in their every you know in their life. And so all of the subjects also followed the same pill taking schedule. On odd number days they took their pills. So they kept as much as they could constant and the same for every treatment group, regardless of what pills they were taking. And then remember the last part of a good experiment is that replication part. Okay, and so if I'm doing this with 21,996 male physicians and I only have four treatment groups, then I have over 5,000 uh, subjects in each treatment group. And so that should make a difference. That should help ensure that the heart attack difference that they noticed here was due to the aspirin and not due to just chance variation with the random assignment. Okay, there were more than 5,000 subjects that were assigned there. Okay, so that shows us uh, what a good experiment would look like. And I think that's enough for today. We will kind of finish up the chapter next time, looking at completely randomized designs and block designs and uh, some more, adding some more vocabulary. So if you have not been uh, working with this vocabulary, with either flashcards, Quizlet, whatever that you do that helps you with vocabulary, you need to start because we're just going to continue to add more and more vocabulary.